Hello, my name is Kim Eagle. I'm the editor of ACC.org. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I'm joined today by Deepak Bhatt from the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And we're with you on Sunday, November 15th, at the National Scientific Sessions of the American Heart Association. Uh, obviously, this is a virtual meeting, but we're delighted to provide you some coverage of key clinical trials that we think are important. And today we're gonna to talk about several trials looking at fish oil. We'll look at the use of agents after PCI. We do one month of DAP, six month of DAP. There's a nice study looking at a new drug for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And an important sub-study in the Colcott trial, looking at the potential value of colchicine for patients with ischemic heart disease. So Deepak, let's start. There's two studies today that uh, we wanted to talk about related to fish oil. One of them is called STRENGTH, and the other is called, I believe, OMEMI. Tell us about these two trials. Yeah, absolutely. So STRENGTH is a trial, a large study that examined a novel omega-3 fatty acid, four grams a day of a mixture of DHA and EPA. And we already knew the results because a press release had been issued uh, a while back saying that the trial was terminated for futility. And in fact, the company sponsoring the trial killed the drug completely. So even coming into the trial, I think everybody had a sense that it must have had no sort of efficacy. And that's what the results in fact showed just absolutely no signal of efficacy with respect to cardiovascular risk reduction. So there were sort of side effects in terms of poor GI tolerability and also an increase in atrial fibrillation that was seen. So no benefit, uh, poor tolerability, side effect. And I think the company was right in, in, in uh, uh, killing that drug. So uh, pretty definitive results. And even though uh, it seemed like that might be a promising approach to some folks, it turned out that it wasn't at all. Uh, Mamie was using a lower dose uh, of gram a day of EPA and DHA, basically a supplement uh, type uh, approach to omega-3 fatty acids in patients with the recent MI. And that too was negative, uh, not showing any benefit. Though there as well, there was more atrial fibrillation, not statistically significantly so in this case, but numerically so. Uh, so to me, amaine is quite important because it is more evidence that we ought to tell patients to just stop taking supplements just because they feel like they ought to be on them. The omega-3 fatty acid supplements are highly prevalent in use in many regions of the world, U.S. included, and I think it's a good idea to actively de-prescribe them. A couple of things I wanted to ask you about. First of all, I believe the Omami was from Norway. Uh, and I, there's a large uh, consumption of fish in the Scandinavian countries. Do you think that potentially influences the outcome of a study like this? You know, that's a terrific question. It, it's hard for me to say for sure, but my guess is if something works, it's going to work irrespective of baseline consumption of fish. And evidence supporting that statement comes from the JELUS trial, which is an trial done in the 2000s, published in The Lancet in 2007, that looked at pure EPA, 1.8 grams a day, actually icosapentethyl, uh, and found a significant reduction in cardiovascular events in a Japanese population who, especially at the time the trial was done, presumably had higher levels of fish intake than would be common in many other regions of the world. So it still benefited them despite having baseline levels of EPA or icosapentaenoic acid in Japan that are higher than you'd see in the US. So I don't think that's the explanation because there's a bunch of studies now of mixtures of DHA and EPA at about a gram that have been negative, the VITAL trial, the ASCEND trial, some have been prescriptions, some have been supplement, but basically the same uh, doses of mixtures of EPA and DHA and they've been uniformly negative. There've been some positive secondary endpoints or subgroups, but the overall trials have been consistently negative. Our learning audience, I think, is probably as confused as I am about <laughs> the, the, the studies of fish oil. Most of them look negative. And then we have reduce it, which really, really looked positive. And you were a part of that trial. Give us your interpretation of this sort of confusion. Yeah, sure. No, it, things are confusing. And, and, and frankly, the strength investigators, I think, uh, added to that confusion with the presentation uh, with, with some stuff that's not really, I think, uh, contextually uh, interpreted correctly. So what 
is the situation with reduce it is that we studied a total of four grams a day of a highly purified icosapentaenoic acid or EPA preparation, a prescription medication, not a supplement, and uh, known as icosapentethyl. And the trial was very robustly positive. They have been looked at by multiple ways, uh, looked at by the FDA, by Health Canada, put through the ringer by a few different independent statistical analyses, and they really hold up. And I think something that people have forgotten or maybe never knew is what I alluded to, that there was in fact a preceding trial of icosapentethyl, the JELUS trial, at 1.8 grams a day. So a lower dose than we used in Japanese patients with higher baseline EPA levels. So we took largely Western patients with low EPA levels and gave them a bunch of icosapentethyl. In JELUS, they took people with relatively higher EPA levels from Japan and gave them a lower dose of EPA than we did. And that trial was positive as well, you know, in terms of primary endpoints, time to first event, and reduce it to 25% relative risk reduction. But in JELUS, a 19% relative risk reduction. So I must say to me, the fact that we gave more icosapentethyl to a population that was at higher risk than JELUS, JELUS was mostly primary prevention. We were mostly secondary prevention to reduce it. And in a Western versus a Japanese population, we were expecting to see a higher relative risk reduction than in JELUS. So, you know, sometimes uh, patients uh, or more so uh, physicians say, oh, there's got to be, you know, two independent trials or I'm not going to change practice. But there are two independent trials, in fact, uh, of, of icosapentethyl specifically. And I think a lot of doctors don't realize that icosapentethyl was also studied in JELUS. So it's not just EPA, generically speaking, it's specifically icosapentethyl. So two independent trials. And the one other thing that's a difference, one major limitation of the JELUS trial, in my opinion, as a trialist, is that it was a randomized trial, check, great, uh, but it was open label. Probe design, which is a good design, but open label, meaning randomized, but no placebo is given. Of course, we did reduce it in the more rigorous fashion with a placebo. But if someone, for example, doesn't like our choice of placebo and reduce it, well, then go back to jealous. They didn't use any placebo. But then if you're going to say, I don't like reduce it because of its placebo, I don't like jealous because there's no placebo, then, you know, it's just, uh, I think it's a matter of being a contrarian. But, uh, but I think the story for uh, EPA is extremely strong and growing. Yeah, it's, it's a pure compound. It was a high dose and it's different than these trials that were reported today. So important for our audience, I think. There was a, a small study here uh, looking at the uh, Explore Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy study. You remember we reported not long ago this drug Mavicamptan has benefit in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is a study that actually looked at the uh, MRI cohort uh, to see what were the structural changes that we're seeing with this unique and novel drug for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there were surprising, or perhaps not surprising, major reductions in left atrial size and in myocardial mass. Uh, and this, to me, just further cements the, the notion that we have a drug now that is going to become available for treating hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and I'm excited about it. The, the trial was positive. This Substudy is uh, helpful for understanding some of the physiologic benefits of the agent. Uh, what did you think of it? Totally agree with you. I mean, this is when people talk about precision medicine and targeting therapeutics to specific patient phenotypes. I mean, this is, this is it. So I think the science here is incredible, but beyond just the theoretical aspects in a way that translates to improvements in human health. So to me, uh, this uh, particular drug for these patients looks great but even more broadly shows that we can actually take some of these really incredible scientific advances to the bedside. Yeah, exactly. I tried to, I tried to get this agent for a patient of mine last week. And uh, unfortunately, the, the drug is now in another trial, which I think is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction right. uh, and is not yet available for our patients. But I'm hopeful that within the coming months, we'll have it and it could be a, a major advance for us. Yeah, um, it'll look great too. One of the big questions we continue to wrestle with deep back is how long do we need to use dual antiplatelet agents after PCI? And there's another important trial reported today, one month DAPT, which uh, gets at this question a bit. 
Tell us about the trial. Absolutely. This is, I think, another important trial for this discussion of just how long do we go with that, the long-standing controversy in the world of cardiology. And this suggests that a short duration of month is probably okay in select patients. They randomized patients to either a month or six to 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. It was, uh, I'll say, you know, non-urgent uh, PCI. There were some ACS patients, but it wasn't, you know, totally uh, emergent type PCI. And in that context, the overall primary endpoint lumping together ischemic and bleeding outcomes, no different. But even looking at ischemic outcomes, realizing a trial of about 3,000 patients, you know, not uh, incredible statistical power, but still, you know, there've been a bunch of modest sized trials like this. And the message has been pretty consistent. It seems okay to shorten duration of DAPT in, in carefully selected patients to get into these trials. So no excess in ischemic events. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I think it just shows with modern stents, you don't have to go a long-term adapt for the stent. Now you might want to for the underlying atherothrombotic condition. Interestingly, in the subgroup of ACS patients here, it looked like longer adapt was better with an interaction p-value that was under 0.05. So to me, I guess it's consistent with what I believe. If someone's having totally elective PCI, stable angina, I think you can get away with a month or three months of DAPT. I tend to go a little bit longer, but if there's issues with bleeding or fears of bleeding because of the patient's specific risk profile, you know, then shorten the DAPT. But I think that if they've come in with an ACS or they've got a bunch of other risk factors, you know, bad diabetes or, or just a lot of atherosclerosis, PD and so forth, assuming they're not at high bleeding risk, I think going longer is better. And there are a lot of trials that show that, not just for the six to 12 month, compared to arm, but going even longer duration than that. So uh, I, I think this trial is helpful. It's informative. It's consistent with multiple other similarly modest sized trials, meaning with careful patient selection, uh, you can use a shorter duration of DAP these days. Do you think that, you know, we're, we're, we're shortening this curve a bit. Do you think it's because of the profile of the stents or the drug eluding nature of the stents or patient selection? Um, the bar is moving and uh, what, what's driving it? I think all of the above, those are great points you raised and each of them I think has contributed to a decreasing incidence of stent thrombosis, both periprocedurally, but even longer term. It's not eliminated, it's still a problem when it happens, can be very bad. But uh, one thing is that the second generation drug eluting stents were really much better than the first generation drug eluting stents. The first generation drug eluting stents, this is perhaps a discussion for another day, you know, perhaps were adopted a bit prematurely. They weren't clearly safer than bare metal stents. They reduced restenosis and repeat revascularization, but they did increase stent thrombosis compared with bare metal stents, uh, a message the interventional cardiology community doesn't like to always hear or admit. But the second generation drug eluting stents have a lower rate of stent thrombosis than first generation and probably also lower rates than bare metal stents. So they actually are more efficacious, less revascularization due to less restenosis, and also safer. So it, it, it's a double win there. And I think that's really what's driving these changes that we're seeing in minimal required DAP duration. But other things too, you know, lower profile as well, thinner stent struts. So it's not just the drug and the polymer, it's also the metal. If it's thinner, that's associated with less stent thrombosis and also less restenosis. And it might be to an extent greater adoption, even though rates are relatively low in the US, but in some places like Japan, relatively higher uses of things like intravascular ultrasound and OCT to make sure the stents really well expanded and well opposed to the arteries. So all those things are gonna likely contribute to lower stent thrombosis rates. Yeah, I think you're right. I also think we're getting better in secondary prevention overall. We're, we're lowering LDLs lower. We're uh, more aggressive with blood pressure. We're clearly getting better with diabetes, finding and treating sleep apnea. There's so many uh, parameters that are leading to this dramatic improvement in our patients who have uh, coronary disease and require uh, PCI. It's, uh, it's exciting. Absolutely, totally agree with that. The second so related, related to that, DPAC then is a, a sub-study that's being reported today on the diabetes cohort of Colcott You'll remember this is a study looking at the value of colchicine in patients with ischemic heart disease uh, and quite a significant risk reduction it appeared out at a year or two from adding colchicine to standard care 
and patients with ischemic heart disease. And I think we reported on this from the European meeting. And, and one of the things, one of the signals we were worried about a little bit was uh, non-cardiac death. Uh, there was a signal of possibly more of that in the, in the colchicine group. Today, the, the Colcott investigators reported on about a thousand patients with diabetes in their study. And once again, uh, colchicine appeared to reduce ischemic events in the diabetics who got colchicine compared to placebo in the 35 to 40% range, um, which was very encouraging for the agent. But when I looked at the fine print again, I saw that both uh, pneumonia and infection were higher in the group that got uh, colchicine. And the pneumonia numbers were 11 versus two, which was a highly significant signal. And I, I'm still wondering when, if I should be using colchicine. What do you think? Yeah, it's a great question, a terrific trial. Uh, no question in my mind at this point that anti-inflammatory approaches, at least some of them, such as canakinumab and cantos and colchicine here, reduce cardiovascular events. So inflammation is definitely part of what's going on with atherosclerosis acting up and misbehaving. The question is, is there something that we can actually bring to the patient? And I think all the colchicine trial data to date is, is pretty provocative and supportive. Uh, but you raise an important point, you know, are there off-target, or not necessarily off-target, maybe expected sort of uh, side effects from quieting down inflammation. Too much inflammation in the artery, in the coronary artery, at the site of a plaque is bad. But of course, if we have a fever, inflammation uh, can be good. If we have an infection, inflammation is uh, necessary. So uh, it's a matter of uh, striking the right balance with the degree of inflammation uh, and quieting it. And it might depend on the patient and their level of risk and perhaps their risk for infection. So, you know, I think there's still uh, a lot to learn about the role of inflammation in atherosclerosis. There's still trials that are going on and starting in this space, both with drugs like colchicine, but also more expensive experimental sorts of uh, anti interleukin type drugs. So we'll, we'll find out more. I'm, I'm actually sharing a, date, a data safety mind board for a big colchicine trial, uh, the CLEAR Synergy trial that the folks at uh, Population Health Research in Canada, McMaster University, are doing. So there's going to be more data coming out you know, in the next couple of years that will hopefully nail down what the risks and benefits are of colchicine and other anti inflammatories in cardiovascular disease. Yeah, it's, it's a very important. Field. I, I hope that we, with these larger trials, we can maybe winnow out the, the group of patients that maybe is at higher risk for the non-cardiovascular endpoint, particularly infectious, and the group most likely to benefit as well. And then practitioners like me will have a better feel for when we should be adding this drug to our usual care and when we should probably step, step back and not necessarily do that. Well, um, I want to thank our uh, audience today for tuning in to our acc.org coverage of uh, the American Heart Association. I'm Kim Eagle, and I've been joined by Deepak Bhatt. Great trials today, uh, fish oil, the use of uh, antiplatelet drugs after PCI, treating hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, the use of uh, colchicine in patients with uh, diabetes and ischemic heart disease, all problems that you and I face in our practices, and we hope this report is of use to you. And the material supporting us, the slides, the manuscripts is on acc.org. Please go there for your reference material. Thanks for joining us.